There we are. Good afternoon and welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. I'm Anthony Gray, your president-elect, and I'm pinch hitting today for President Jason, who is out of town. Thank you so much for joining us. It is wonderful to see full rooms again. Um, it really is nice. Please remain standing for our opening patriotic song. Robert Reed will lead us in singing the national anthem accompanied by Robin Ryan on the violin and Elaine Mishra on the keys. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight? Oh, the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say thus the star spangled banner yet wave Oh, the the home of the brave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, Robin, and Elaine. This meeting today is sponsored by Food Fight Restaurant Group. Yeah. And Rotarians Amanda Jobs, CFO and partner Greg Frank, board member and partner since 1994. Food Fight has been a significant part of the Madison culinary scene, starting with Monty's Blue Plate Diner. The group now includes nearly 20 diverse locally owned restaurants offering a full range of dishes from classic American fare to refined Italian cuisine. While most of the locations are in Madison, the group's reach expanded to Milwaukee's Deer District with the opening of Il Cervo in May 2023. Food Fight is deeply committed to community involvement, actively participating in local events, supporting various charity initiatives. We would like to thank them for their sponsorship and for advancing Rotary's mission. Now, oh, he's at my table. Now we're gonna have Connor Moran come up and introduce today's guests. Thank you very much. Um, today, we have a great number of guests. Uh, we'll start with, uh, I would like to ask all of our guests to stand, and um, at the end of our guest introductions, we will greet all of you. Um, today, we are joined by Joe Musser, a guest of Cheryl DeMars. Uh, we are joined by Candace Welsh, guest of Fred Mose. Jack Idlis, guest of Joel Rivlin. Holly Laux O'Higgins, guest of Margaret Murphy, and Craig Weisensell, guest of Margaret Murphy. Janet Brandt and Mike Brandt, guests of Paul Olson. Joe Plasterer, guest of Paul Riemann. Anna, I'm sorry, Annalise Beckman, guest of Peter Lewandowski. Justin Giorgio, guest of the program committee. Chow Chang, guest of the RYE committee. And Courtney Fennell, a visiting Rotarian from New Haven, Connecticut. Please welcome all of our guests today. A special welcome to New Haven, my former hometown. We have a few quick announcements before we get on to the program. 
the first, our Rotary Veterans Fellowship Group meets right after the luncheon today. And their featured speaker will be Steve Rose. Stephen is the executive director of Fisher House, Wisconsin, and they welcome any interested members to join them in the per and participate in the presentation that will be held poolside just as you come up the stairs to your right. A quick reminder that we're now seeking applications for our annual Manifred Sorinsky Humanitarian Award. There are nomination forms in the back and on the tables, and the deadline to nominate anyone for the award is September 30th. This has been something that has been a long-term club tradition, and some of the most amazing people have received the award. So if you know someone who is worthy of that award, please take the time to nominate them. We want to make sure we have the strongest pool possible. Former President Charles McLimans has a quick announcement. He is the Rotary Director of the Nominating Committee. And Charles, I cede the stage. <laughs> Oh, it's good to be back at the podium. <laughs> um, as Anthony mentioned, I'm chairing this year's uh, Director Nominating Committee. And uh, this is the time of the year when we start looking, um, start our process for identifying new board members. Our Director Nominating Committee meets later this month, and we will develop a list of 12 member nominees. The election of six new directors will take place on November 13th. As our committee reviews potential nominees, we look at information such as whether the member has uh, been a chairperson of a committee or fellowship group. Typically, we look at members who've been in the club for several years so that they understand how our club operates. And while we no longer have an attendance policy, we also look at engagement. Are, are they engaged? Are they providing leadership? Are they showing up for our lunches? So those are uh, some of the characteristics. Are, you, are they giving to our, uh, our campaigns, our community grants campaign, our international campaign? So, um, if any of the, of the members elected to the board becomes eligible, uh, they are elected to the board, they also become eligible, eligible to become president. So um, we're looking for, for people to make recommendations, suggestions on who might, uh, who might be a good leader. Who have you seen providing leadership in our club? Who would you like to see standing at this podium? Right. So those are all questions that we uh, that we ask as we're identifying our next group of leaders for the board. So um, please, um, if you have a suggestion, uh, somebody that you think is providing would be a good leader, is providing good leadership in the club, um, then email Pat at the Rotary office, and we thank you. Thank you, Charles. As is our tradition, we of course have a few birthdays to announce. We celebrate them with a bit of humor or wisdom that complements Rotary's mission. We encourage members to make a gift to our foundation's community grants endowment fund that represents their age, of course, rounded up to 100, for our Synergy Scholarship Fund. Our birthdays are in order. September 9th, Melinda Heinrichs. September 9th, Mike Wilson. September 11th, Emily Grunewald. Ooh, somebody liked it. September 12th, Alan Klugman. September 13th, Tom DeChan. September 14th, Kai Gardner Mishlov. September 14th, Rick Gregory Jr. And September 14th, Deputy Mayor Linda Flacunta. We held a monthly board meeting last week. <laughs> You can tell I'm the fill-in. <laughs> Happy birthday. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. Thanks to our celebrants and their contributions to the Madison Rotary Foundation Community Grants Endowment Fund. And we've already wished them a happy birthday. We held our monthly board meeting last month and I encourage members to review the board minutes that are posted in the members only section of our club's website. By a show of hands, how many have mastered the Rotary website? Yeah. At some point, there may need to be some kind of seminar. Um, <laughs> I am still doing my very best with it. We want members to meet our current board members, so we ask one board member every month to introduce the speakers for that week. This month, Maggie Porter Krentz will be doing the introductions. Maggie is the Senior Director of Leadership and Major Gifts for the United Way of Dane County. She is in her second of a two-year term on our club board of directors. Maggie will now come to the podium to introduce today's speakers. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today, our program is on the topic of restoring public faith in our elections in Wisconsin. We have two speakers who will be talking with us about this topic. Scott Klug is a Milwaukee native and former congressman who represented Madison in the U.S. House. He is the creator of the popular podcast, Lost in the Middle, America's Political Orphans. He is also co-chair of the federal public affairs practice at the national law firm of Foley and Lardner. Mandela Barnes served as the 45th Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin from 2019 to 2023 after previously serving in the Wisconsin State Assembly at a, as a state representative from 2013 to 2017. He is currently president of Forward Together Wisconsin. Our club's program committee chair, Janet Perino, will serve as moderator for today's program. As they make their way up to the stage area, I want to mention that we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way to say thanks for speaking to us today. Um, I also want to mention that we will have question and answer with our speakers as the, um, at the end as the time allows, but please wait for the microphone if you have a question. So please join me in welcoming them to our stage. While our guests are getting situated and Janet is preparing, I would ask if we might hold just the briefest moment of silence in recognition of the 9-11 attacks and, and hopefully the rebuilding thereafter. Thank you very much. Janet. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. And first of all, on behalf of our membership, we really want to thank both Mr. Krug, Krug and uh, Mr. Barnes for being here today. Uh, this could not be a more interesting time in politics. I don't think our country could be more divided than it is. So we really applaud both of you for coming together from both sides of the aisle and stepping up for one of the cornerstones of our democracy, free and fair elections. I'm sure for many of you involved in the Democracy Defense Project, it would have been easier to sit this one out. So thank you. Really appreciate your being here. Let's get started. So the first question is, please tell us about the genesis of the Democracy Defense Project. How did this initiative start? And how did each of you get involved in the project? 
All right. Well, uh, thanks so much, first of all, for having us. Uh, really excited to be here, uh, part of this very important effort to promote election integrity, uh, especially in some spaces where uh, it's not always top of mind and in areas where there is a lot of doubt on elections and election results. So many of us watched the debate last night, and there were still uh, questions called into the 2020 election, which we all know was decided fairly. And we all know uh, that election officials across this entire country are now, you know, I don't want to say paying a price, but they are dealing with the ramifications of people doubt of people's doubt uh, in election outcomes. It is a very scary time for folks who work really hard to make sure elections are administered properly. Uh, people who are now, unfortunately, having to put their own safety at risk to, in the cause of our democracy. So this organization came together uh, as a result of folks across the country. There are a number of uh, different democracy defense projects across the country, uh, but here in Wisconsin, where uh, it is vitally important, as we know, there was a slate of fake, uh, fake electors here uh, who wanted to overturn uh, the real results of the election. And understanding that this isn't just a Democratic or Republican issue, it's something that we all need to be cognizant of. If we want the future of this democracy to actually exist, uh, it's going to take us coming together and instilling trust in elections and the electoral process. That means Republicans talking to Republicans, Democrats talking to Democrats. And there have been instances, uh, you know, where Democrats have also called into question election results, uh, but understanding how far it went on January 6, 2021. Uh, knowing the importance of this upcoming election and preventing something like that from ever happening again uh, is what I would uh, say is the genesis of this organization coming together. Thank you, Representative Kluge. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there you go. There's the bipartisan spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like the debate last night, right? Uh, look, thanks uh, uh, for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. And it's nice to be back in a familiar face, although it's been a while since I was here during campaigns and speaking on a routine basis back in the day. Yeah, I think Mandela's absolutely right. I mean, we need to be careful that we don't undermine our democracy even further in this election. Now, there's always been cynicism about US politics, right? My dad always said when he died he wanted to be buried in Chicago so he could stay politically active. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that sort of hung around us uh, for a long time. But you know, sort of as the Republican in, in the room, let me hit the sort of nail on the head in the 2020 election. So there's been lots of complaints and a lot of allegations that Donald Trump really won the Wisconsin uh, presidential election. Here, here are the facts. If you add up all the votes that Republican congressional candidates Dates got in the state and gave them to Donald Trump, he would have won Wisconsin by 40,000 votes. So there clearly was a drop off among Republicans and independents when it came to the presidential race that didn't exist otherwise. But Mandela and I are here not only to talk about you all, one of the other, I think, untold stories in this is what the allegations have done to folks who worked in the election system for years. My mother in law was a loyal poll worker in Merrill, Wisconsin, which is about 15 miles north of Wausau. She did it almost every election. But half the folks who administer elections in the country have quit in the last four years. And they've quit because the sort of harassment you sort of think of in the abstract is very real for them. I mean, it's, you know, and even in Republican districts, in the podcast, we talked to the Republican uh, Secretary of State in Idaho, in a very Republican state, and he says, I've got my own frequent flyers. I mean, and you think it's hard enough to do work, just try to do work in an election place where you've got people standing over the shoulder watching everything you do. And so, you know, in Wisconsin, for example, you know, I think Mandela and I were both disappointed that the legislature and the governor couldn't get a ballot, an, an initiative across uh, in the state legislature this year, which would have allowed voting of Wisconsin absentee votes to start even before the election itself came up, so that when the polls ended, you'd, you'd have a sense that you wouldn't have to have these trucks that show up in Milwaukee at 10 o'clock at night that everybody reads in a conspiracy into. But the fact is, the votes have to stay locked up till the polls close because that's what the laws are in Wisconsin. Watch how fast Texas and Florida turn their election returns around this this uh, fall in a couple of weeks. And it's interesting because if you look at the battleground state, that was the train wreck in twenty in two thousand in Biden and uh, excuse me, in Gore and and 
Bush, it was Florida and it was specifically Miami-Dade and Broward County, Florida. I mean, if they can fix it in Florida in a state that's far larger than us, we should be able to get that one simple reform done in Wisconsin, which would alleviate a lot of the drama about trucks showing up in Milwaukee at 10 o'clock at night because by state law, that's what they're supposed to do. Thank you for that. Um, I understand the Democracy Defense Project commissioned a poll about voters' thoughts on the integrity of our elections. What is voters' level of trust in Wisconsin elections, and does it differ from their confidence in elections nationwide? So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I, Go for it. <laughs> oh, there it is. All right, there we go. We got it. We got it. Um, so unfortunately, uh, voter confidence is not where it should be. Uh, and this does fall on partisan lines, too. There is uh, less trust from uh, Republican respondents in that poll uh, to you know their faith in the elections versus uh, Democrats. Um, but we still want it to be higher on both sides. We should be uh, able to fully, uh, essentially, trust our, our election outcomes. And not to say that there should be no skepticism at all, because that's not right. That's not, you know, that, that just shouldn't be the case. I mean, saying that there should be no skepticism is a call for skepticism. Uh, but our election process is open to the public. And for people who have doubts, I always say, well, just go check out the process. Uh, go observe, uh, you know, an election. Uh, go be an, an election observer. Uh, you can do that. You know, unfortunately, we have had instances where uh, people have gone there, found no trouble, and made trouble themselves. Uh, people who have shown up uh, with the intent to disrupt uh, and to absolutely discourage that from any side of the aisle. Uh, but what I do want people to do is take a long look into the boring process and see how absolutely difficult it would be to manipulate election results. And, you know, I feel that if people, you know, were to get involved in the process, in that way, we could uh, ensure more faith in the process. And I know uh, Representative Clue will tell you about Nebraska. I don't want to take that from him. When I'm not in the same room as him, I'll I talk about Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's his story to tell, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let him use that uh, as an example. But uh, the same way that you know, I'm out in my regular day work uh, trying to get people involved in the process just to show up to vote, uh, that is another way we instill, uh, we instill trust in the process. Because because the more people that show up, that means people are in polling locations, people are in polling booths, seeing elections happen as they show up and see you get your receipt, you get your ticket, you put in your ballot, and that's the way it happens. And so voter turnout is also another way for us to, to, to get that trust back up. So Janet, if you look nationally, um, Wisconsin performs a little bit better in terms of people's confidence in the process here. If you ask people if they're very confident and somewhat confident, it's, it's about 75%. Nationally, it's about 72%. Mandel is right. There's a split between Republicans and Democrats and independents, not to be surprising, I think, given the rhetoric on the Republican side in recent years. Um, but let, let me talk about Nebraska, which I think is a really cool idea. So, you know, one of the um, interesting arguments is how do you restore faith in the electoral system? Uh, how many people in this room have ever served on jury duty? How many of you came away with that? With Put your hands up if you came away thinking, feeling even better about the jury system in the country. Almost all of you. So what Nebraska did, and they're the only state in the country, is they actually allow county governments to summon election workers, like you do jurors. If you don't show up, guess what? You get arrested. So they have a pretty good turnout rate. And people try to finagle their way out of it in the same way that, I mean, if you ever sat on jury duty, I mean, some of the stories, bless you, some of the stories told by jurors, potential jurors to try to get out would make like a Netflix series on its own. And so um, it, it, what they do is you get, an, you get a summons. The summons says you have to work four elections. Now, they could be presidential years. They could be school board, spring elections, whatever the case might be. And and it's amazing because we actually, back to my series, we talked to the guy who runs elections in, in uh, Douglas County, Nebraska, which is um, Omaha. And he said he can remember two years ago walking through the hallways of the county building, and here's the husband of the wife of mayor in Omaha. And he says, hey, Charlie, what are you doing here? And he says, well, hell, you should know why I'm here. You're the one who sent me the summons. I've got, I've got election duty coming up in a few weeks. But it does two things. First of all, it gets people into the 
election machinery who otherwise wouldn't be there. So instead of having my mother-in-law work the same polls for 20 years in Merrill, Wisconsin, you'd get a broad selection of people in this room. And when you're inside, like being inside the jury room, you really understand how the system works. So I'll give you one other example. You know, one of the great reforms that was proposed after Gore and Bush was to put cameras in counting centers. And what's the biggest source of conspiracy theories from four years ago was the fact people could see cameras in the voting centers, but there was no play-by-play. -play. So I, hail Man I give Mandela a box, and he turns around and you know gives uh, Casey a, a piece of paper here, and so people, you know, are going, "What? What are they doing? They're moving stuff around. They're moving these boxes over here. They're moving bo those boxes over there." Well, if you're in the county center and in the voting centers, like you'd be in Nebraska, you know exactly what's going on because you're the guy, you're the woman moving the box or handling the papers. And the other thing it does, right? So this year in Douglas. County, uh, Nebraska, 45% of the election workers will be people who are only there because they got subpoenaed. Now, you want to try to run a conspiracy to defraud election? Do it with 45% of the people in the room who only don't want to be there, or are only there because they don't want to go to jail. So I think that's a, you know, I think always you have to keep in mind Elections in the U.S. are run at the state level. Elections at the state level are run at the county level. And I think it would be great. We've always used the states as a laboratory of experiment. And I think Nebraska is a perfect example of a way people have got done, gotten things done right. Very interesting. Thank you. And um, Mandela, you referred to the long, boring process. We are going to have the opportunity to delve into that because Mary Beth Witzelbale, the M Madison City Clerk, is going to come and talk to us about that long, boring process and some of the safety uh, items that are involved. So thank you. Um, can you tell us what did voters say would increase their trust in elections the most? And have any of those ideas been implemented? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm going in my head trying to remember the laundry list. Actually, in Wisconsin, it was interesting when they asked people what they thought would improve the process. Wisconsin's adopted nearly every one of them. The only one we've missed on is the early voting counting. Um, so Wisconsin's got a good a good track record there. I think if you look at what makes people worried about elections, it really won't surprise you. On the Republican side, there's a lot of skepticism about drop boxes. On the Democratic side, there's a, a lot of pushback against um, uh, voter ID um, and, and suppressing election. The fact in both of those situations, if you look nationally, there's very little indication it does anything at the margins because the allegations have been over a handful of votes. It's really not going to change it. The one thing I think that's got people really spooked is AI. And normally when you think about AI, you think about fake videos, right? But they're also bad and so corny. Most of the time you can spot them. I don't think it's really a major issue, although it's there have been serious allegations in Costa Rica and in New Zealand and a lot of other elections around the country in the last two years. But what AI really does is give you the opportunity to monkey around with the machinery of elections. You know, don't deliver the ballots on Tuesday, deliver them on Wednesday. Oh, we changed the address of where things are going on. Oh, if you have election duty, forget about that training you're supposed to show up on. Or you send uh, stuff to people that says, remember, this year Republicans are voting on Tuesday and Democrats are voting on Wednesday. And so you can sort of gum up the works, right? If the ballots aren't where they're supposed to be, if poll workers aren't showing up on time, that's the biggest risk, I think, in elections this time out with AI. It's not some little video that people crank out. So that's what people really are spooked about and I think they have a right to be worried about because we still haven't figured out social media and Facebook after a decade of trying to deal with it. And now along comes AI and the ability to, again, interfere with the machinery of the election system. Yeah, and just to add on that, like it's you know it's not the deep fakes, it's the shallow fakes, it's the small, it's the small tweaks that you know make a person see something just slightly other than it truly is, and it it changes perception and it it, it skews reality, and the truth becomes no more. 
Thank you. Um, as you both said, most voters don't know the process. So if voter knowledge is a big challenge, how do we inform voters about the protections in place in ways that will resonate with them? And who are our best messengers? So there's always, you know, certain voter guides that come out from clerks that, you know, talk about, you know, let's say election day is coming up. Uh, I think it would be important, as you mentioned, uh, what people feel would, you know, increase faith in the process and the things that we are already doing as a state, whether uh, there are things we agree with or things that we don't politically, uh, if we have that defined checklist that says, remember to bring, you know, your ID, you needed to vote, uh, you know, and everything else, just even using the data, the things that were in the polling, whether it's, you know, the paper ballots, the, you know, when the votes are being counted, and also, uh, invite people to become poll workers as well when that information goes out. Uh, you know, call for, uh, announce, advertise, uh, you know, the process for uh, becoming an election observer. Give that option. It shows where you go online to sign up, be a poll worker, be a poll observer. Um, I think that, you know, incrementally will help over time. I don't think in one cycle we'll be able to instill trust to the level, to the degree that we would like for it to be. Uh, but over time, uh, it, it becomes a part of people's just understanding and knowledge overall of, of elections. I think that's what the Democracy Defense Program is about. If you look at where we're located, where the bipartisan groups are, it tends to be in states that are battleground states. So, for example, in Georgia, Saxby Chambliss, who's an old buddy of mine, who I served in the House with, who was a senator for 12 years from Georgia, is one of the other Republican chairs. Here in Wisconsin, J.B. Van Hollen, former Republican Attorney General, is one of the quartet, along with Mike Tate, who used to be the Executive Director of the Democratic Party. So I think you see folks coming together from both sides of the aisle in a lot of the states that will be most critical to the election in a few weeks. But obviously our, our uh, work's not going to be done, I think, after this November. Uh, hopefully it won't be nearly as confusing as it is. But I think continuing to implement this series of reform ideas, continuing to borrow ideas from other states and other counties who do things right, I think will we'll fix it. But you see a, a firm commitment from people on both sides of the aisle to get it done right. Terrific. Uh, I think it's an understatement to say that much has changed in the political world over the last several weeks. Um, how has our summer of roller coaster politics influenced voter attitudes towards election integrity? Yeah. <laughs> the mics aren't working. We can't answer that question. <laughs> I don't think it really. I don't think it really matters one way or the other. I think there's a heightened, you know, sort of anxiety going into this that I think's been building over the last two years. But I don't think anything's really changed in the in the last months, and I don't think it will change in the month leading up to the election. For folks who are skeptics, we're not going to completely convince them. For folks who believe in the system, we need them to talk to their neighbors and friends about the fact things work right here. Yeah, and the roller coaster isn't over yet. Yeah, That's my hot take. <laughs> um, Representative Klug, you mentioned the, um, the bipartisan prop, uh, effort to reform the way that absentee ballots are counted. That hasn't passed. Is there anything that can be done in terms of messaging to help people understand that it's they need to be processed and that takes time in a county like Milwaukee? And so there's we have to expect, right, that there is going to be what they call a ballot dump late at night. How can we get that word out? Um, or what you're doing here. It would be a good idea not to tell people you're having a speaker about the very boring election process. <laughs> I don't think that'll help and turn out in a few weeks. Um, I, no, I, I think this is really, you know, if you look today, most people make a lot of decisions about voting and about the election system by listening to people who are basically sort of in their crowd, right, in their community. That's how people organize these days. And so I think one-on-one -on -one conversation social media with your friends. I mean, folks are just as likely to get their news from Facebook as anything else. Um, and that's you know, a, a, a problem for society as a whole, right? The, we don't get up in the morning and read the same newspaper anymore. Chances are we're on different social media pages. There's, you know, 
540 channels of which all of us only watch about 11 anyway. Um, and so I think, I think whatever you can do individually to friends of yours, family, co-workers, and essentially make the case that the system works well, I think is more valuable than anything Mandela and I and the rest of our team can do. Yeah. The same way, uh, even when we're trying to increase voter turnout, we say there's nothing better than the credible messengers. There's nothing better than the person that you spend time with that you ask for advice on other topics. And so I'm sure, I mean, I, there's got to be folks that, you know, we all know who have said something in, in regards. And it may not even be something major. It may not be a person who says, oh, the election was stolen. But there may be a person who's a little curious or maybe a person who feels that something is a little off. And so when we can talk to those people and just listen. I mean, I think that's an important part too, is you know, doing more listening uh, than talking to figure out or what makes a person feel that this is the case. And uh, it'll, in most instances, come back to one of the things that is already being done in the state to uh, maintain uh, secure elections. And the more that we know, uh, the more that we can help uh, inform people. Thank you. Um, so what happens to the Democracy Defense Project after Election Day? Representative Klu, you mentioned that you hope it would continue. Um, how do you see that uh, effort continuing? And uh, do you think that these kinds of groups might be involved if there is uh, doubt again put forth after the election as to whether or not it was fair? I don't think we'd be involved actually in investigations or trying to make the case. I think we just want to be there as a resource and also indicate our affirmation that we think the election system in Wisconsin works well and works fairly. But again, I, 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 a lot of the reforms that came, came out of the Bush Gore fiasco in Florida um, were actually adopted like, you know, one of the recommendations was the video cameras in the counting centers to try to head it off at the pass and it created its own problem. But for example, there's a group in Washington, D.C. called the Bipolicy, uh, uh, BIPAC, B.I. Policy mm -hmm. Activity Center, what it is, which is actually funded by a lot of large uh, businesses and uh, nonprofits in Washington to try to work on election reform ideas. So they, we actually went through huge wave in like 2005 and 2006 with changes to voting systems all across the country to convert systems, to train election workers, to do a lot of things. And we'll probably need to do that again to have another wave of election reforms and education of people after this election cycle. And uh, God willing, it'll be much calmer than the Bush Gore thing, which is, you know, dragged on for months and is still a bitter point for people. Yeah. And one thing too, I would say, you know, I lost a very close election. And so I think my credibility on election <laughs> Uh, it's pretty high because I could easily have said, oh, no, something's going, something is amiss. Uh, but I didn't uh, because that wasn't the case. And J.B. Van Hollen, uh, he won a very close election. And I think that having, uh, you know, earned the votes of people from our own parties, um, I think that being able to speak to what you know, we witnessed as candidates what our experiences have been as people who have been on ballots and people who still uh, support folks who have won and lost elections and, you know, not just cry and file because we didn't get our way. And I think that that is ultimately what makes our party stronger, regardless what party you're in. If you're, you, know, you, you you take your lessons from uh, whether it's a, a narrow loss or a big loss, and you do the organizing work, you do what it takes to come back stronger. And I think that's uh, one of the points I like to hit home for people. Thank you. You two have done such a great job of answering my questions, <laughs> even before I asked them, uh, that we are now going to turn the mic over to our members, uh, and so that they have the opportunity to ask questions. Please wait for the mic, as this is being taped, and we want to make sure your questions are heard. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, both for your work and for being here today. Um, Dane County Clerk Scott McDonald has taken the, the uh, step of scanning all of the ballots and making that publicly available. Um, I think that's relatively rare, although it may be happening in more jurisdictions. What are your thoughts on that as a way to help reassure people, because they can literally go count the ballots themselves if they want, um, that, that, uh, that the process has integrity? I mean, I'm not 
I'm not opposed to it. Um, and you know, most people, if they just knowing that that is, sorry, uh, I'm not opposed to that. And I would say that most people just knowing that those ballots are available would have a certain level of comfort because I can't imagine people are going to go through tens of thousands uh, of ballots just to count to make sure on their own. And just knowing that you know, that process takes place could be very helpful. I'm not sure how much that costs, though. Can't be cheap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> journalism and and well, national people who appear to, who appear to be journalists have um, really skewed information in terms of how it goes out there. I don't think there's much of a uh, people don't have as much faith in journalists, national and locally. How does that affect voting? And what would you change if you could change something about that? Okay, well, here goes the journalism graduate student from Northwestern, member of the Medill Board of Visitors, uh, 14 years in television news in Washington, D.C., Seattle, and here. Uh, I think to look at the problem with the news business, this may be a little bit di different answer than you expect. It really looks, it's a really a problem of economics. Uh, and, and the problem began, and people laugh at me when I say this, in 1994 when somebody bought a used Oldsmobile on Craigslist. And it's like, why? Well, because it was the beginning of the end of classified advertising in newspapers. It was 40% of their income. And for those of you of a certain age in this room, and as I look, most of you are of a certain age, <laughs> you, you, you remember Sunday morning papers, right? And it's where you bought cars, it's where you sold cars, it's where you found a job, it's where you bought a puppy, it's where you did everything in the world. And so that was a big hit for the newspaper business. Uh, and I don't think it's fully recovered because what along came the internet and they said, well, this is great. We can now get our papers out to many more people except they didn't bother to charge for any of it. And so you've got one thing that's losing you money and one source of revenue that's gone. So that's the newspaper business. Meanwhile, the same thing is accelerating in the television news business, especially on cable systems. I meant cable systems are hemorrhaging viewers. And because of that, you know, you essentially get a phenomenon where everybody's left turns on MSNBC and everybody who's to the right turns on Fox. And people live in these parallel universes that neither Mandela or I visit on a very regular basis. And so you've got newspapers that have sort of had to tilt the playing field. I mean, the, you know, the New York Times consciously did this when Donald Trump got elected in 16. I mean, anybody who looks at the New York Times, it's very clear their mission was to be the anti-Trump newspaper. And it succeeded wildly. And then when Biden got elected, look what happened to their subscriptions. The Washington Post, I meant, my God, could there be anything more smug than the headline that says, democracy dies in darkness? I mean, it's just, really, give me a break. And so I think when you look at the newspapers, I don't necessarily think that reporters individually uh, change stories. I think journalists are as honest as they've ever been. The problem is what you get on cable TV is often not reporting its opinion. That's what you're starting, I think, more and more to see in the newspaper business as well. If you look at the New York Times or the Washington Post online, the whole right side of the online site, are, it's one opinion after another opinion after another opinion. I don't. The honest answer is I don't know how you're going to fix it because at the end of the day, you can't have a newsroom with 400 reporters unless you have money to pay them. Now, I'll tell you one other little quick little story is that there was um, a, a couple of years ago, um, this is probably now seven or eight years ago, there were a political scientists who looked at news deserts where newspapers disappeared from communities. And they wanted to know something sort of dear and dear to Wisconsin voters' hearts. Did ticket splitting still exist in those communities? Because everything in those papers, if they still existed, uh, would have accentuated things that happened in the local community. And when they disappeared, all people got was national news on the cable systems. And partisanship continued to rise, and ticket splitting diminished significantly. 
in you, Mandela, will know this well. I mean, in Wisconsin, the voters elected a Democratic governor and a Republican senator. And the same thing happened in Georgia, and it happened in Kansas, and it happened in Arizona, and it happened in New Hampshire, it happened in Vermont, it happened in lots of places. So they do this study, and a woman picks it up in Palm Springs, California. And she works for Gannett, and she says, this is driving me crazy, because all we have on our opinion pages are letters about national issues or its national political columnists, and they're all very predictable. She goes to these three professors and said, I want to do this experiment, and for a month, I don't want any national columns, I don't want any national letters to the editors, all I want is stuff about local issues. And so she reaches out to these three professors, and they said, great, we'll interview 2,000 of your subscribers, and we'll interview 2,000 people in another Gannett newspaper down the road in Ventura County, California. And after a month, what they discovered was that in Ventura County, partisanship continues to rise, and in Palm Springs, California, partisanship begins to go down. So I think the solution for the newspaper industry and for local stations in the future is to focus on what's local and get out of this national bubble. And then I think people focus on, are the roads getting repaired? What's happening at the school board? What's happening on more local stuff? So I think that's the key to successful journalism in the future, is more granular at the local level than you can really change the big whales who are just trying to survive. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of the things that you had mentioned was a one-to-one -one relationship to really start building trust in the system. And I started thinking about that's going to take a long time. <laughs> and it made me think about this notion of what is our state nonpartisan religion in which all of us trust? And while you think about that, I'll make it easy. It's the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> so what if we could get the Packers to lead PSAs on voting, voting processes, and safeguards? We've got eight games between now and election day, you could run multiple ads. And I say that somewhat facetiously, but also we have people in our community that people trust, whether it's, you know, Giannis of the Bucks or, you know, folks on the Brewers. I'm not following the Brewers a lot right now. Um, They're doing great. And what's that? They're doing great. <laughs> Been busy. Um, but the point is that can we enlist folks like that to break through that barrier and at least give it a listen, knowing that one-to-one -one is important, but we have a community-owned football team. Well, if Jordan Love comes back quickly, maybe we'll have a lot of people to reach out to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the same way. I mean, I'm, I'm open to anything, and I think that is a, I mean, I think it's a fantastic suggestion. I think there are a lot of things we can do. I mean, if we had a, a budget to do that. <laughs> Justin's on staff for DDP, so I looked at him. Uh, but no, I, I think it would be, I, I think, yeah, if the, the state were to partner with our professional sports teams to do that, of course, have at it. No stone unturned here. But look, we'll we'll take a look. We'll we'll take a pitch. I'm not sure. It might be easier to get a team to get involved than to try yeah. to coordinate the Bucks, the Packers, and the yeah. Brewers, especially when the Brewers would be in the playoffs. But look, nothing. No stone gets unturned. Doesn't hurt to ask. You always can say no. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for the work you're doing. I don't know if you can see my shirt. It says vote. I spent the morning registering voters at the uh, DMV. Uh, they, they come through the line, they get their driver's license or identification, they come over, if they haven't registered, I, lead, I sit them down at the computer and they, I run them through a computer screen put, put up there by the Department of Transportation and, the, uh, and it's myvote.gov. And toward the end of the, when they finish uh, signing up, there's a box that says, I want to be a poll worker. And they look at me and say, I don't think I want to be a poll worker. And then they go on. Uh, and I don't blame them because we have a candidate who wants to arrest and prosecute <coughs> election officials and poll workers and donors because he doesn't like the way they uh, are uh, doing their job. What, what can we do about candidates who threaten people who are involved in election uh, c conducting elections. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, yeah, short of em embarrassing them, I, 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 just, I just don't know. 
I, I don't have any magic answers. And it, party accountability is one thing, but if you are just so set on winning being the only end that's acceptable for you, to where you would go to the extent that you keep promoting this line. Like the, the other frustrating part too is that it just feels like so many people who would even be brave enough to call out the lies, or somebody who would be even brave enough to say, yeah, the 2020 election uh, was fair, it was not stolen, uh, the chances of them getting out of any Republican primary today is very slim. So I think that you got to have people who are willing to put uh, their political future on the line and to do the right thing, but there are very few profiles and courage right now. So it's, it's tough. Thank you for coming here today. Um, can you just, on, on a, kind of on that same note, what about election fraud of the public, of election officials? Can you just comment about the uh, state statutes regarding that? I really can't answer that. Yeah. So, just, just to clarify, it, it, like you mean penalty for voter fraud? Yeah. What do state statutes say about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you the exact uh, amount of time that a person will be facing for, for, for voter fraud. Um, and it would vary also by case to case of the types of voter fraud. Like there's been instances where, you know, some states have gone overboard. There's a woman, I can't think what state that was, but she was still on paper. She wasn't eligible to vote. She had been released from uh, incarceration. She tried to vote. Uh, I think she did cast a ballot. Uh, uh, you know, unbeknownst to her, she couldn't vote. She thought she was eligible. And I forget how much time she got, but it didn't necessarily fit the crime. It wasn't something that she did uh, intentional. You said how many? Five years. Five years. Texas. That was in Texas. Thank you so much. And it's such an informed group. Um, why are we here? Uh, I'm not, I, I couldn't tell you for sure what the, what the what the exact penalty here is in Wisconsin uh, for a person who tries to uh, commit voter fraud, but it is a felony, and it's enough to, to you know deter a person from even you know going that length. But what it would take to actually commit the voter fraud is uh, it's a pretty tough hill to climb to you know, fraudulently submit uh, one vote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is the last question. Okay. Um, uh, Scott, you had talked about the Nebraska initiative, and it sounds uh, very clever, and it sounds like it ought to be effective. Has it been? Yeah, it, it has been, and it's looked at as a model. A lot of folks sort of get, it's funny, I, I actually wrote a comment about this and people got offended because they said this is America and we're supposed to be free and we shouldn't have to work in an election thing if we don't. But, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's your opinion. Show up or you go to jail. But so, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to see other states adopt it, and, and actually I've had conversations with some folks here who are interested in sort of trying to get on that bandwagon and make it happen in Wisconsin and in other states. But I, I think you know, it, it, we started to talk about this uh, in the summer, and I think it would really be an initiative after this year, because as you know, it takes forever to move stuff in legislatures. And I think the sense was, I meant I'd love to see Wisconsin do it, but maybe target three or four other states and see if we can get momentum. So I've had some conversations with BIPAC about trying to do that, but it's, it's in the early stages. Thank you so much to both of you for being here today. Very interesting topic. Thank you. I just want to offer my personal thanks to former Lieutenant Governor Barnes and former Representative Klug. We really appreciate you coming to talk with us on such a complex but very important issue. Um, I also want to thank everybody who's come out to see this. Your participation in this process is a critical component to affecting what these two gentlemen have just suggested. I hope you'll also join us next week when Greg Zellick from the Madison Symphony Orchestra there we go, Robert, our, uh, our music chair. Uh, the Madison Symphony Orchestra will be holding an organ extraordinaire, the 20th anniversary of the Overtures concert organ. And I'm sure many of you have seen it, but if you have not seen it and heard it, it is 
and I don't play any instruments, but it is truly magnificent. Um, so we're going to have lunch here, and then we're going to walk over to the Overture Center for the program portion of our meeting. So I hope that you all will consider joining us for what will be a fun afternoon. Having said that, and for the good of the order, we are adjourned.